Matthew 14, verses 22 through 27. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Good morning, Inspire family, and welcome to our podcast, The Follow-Up. Today I'm joined by Pastor Ernie and Pastor Randy. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Time. Coffee time. Yes, time for some coffee. Hit your coffee and listen in. I'm yeah, that, I I like that as an invitation to our listeners. Get you know, cuddle up with your cup Absolutely. of coffee here and 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 sit down and just listen. Because coffee is an acronym, man. I'm Mister Acu- Acronym. Christ offers freedom and forgiveness for everyone, everywhere. Don't you like that? <laughs> oh, let's just close this off. That's enough for us. That's amazing, Rain Man. Pretty- Way to go. <laughs> 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 well, we aren't here to jibber jabber. What right. you got there, buddy? Well, yeah. So, Randy, I just want to. We're talking about Jesus walking on the water. It's something I think that a lot of us are familiar of the idea of the story, but maybe not the details. Maybe not what we can really grab from that. So, do you, you want to go ahead? Could I start today? Because when when you said that at the beginning, I think we need to just stop just for a moment to just see the situation that the Son of God actually needed rest. I mean, when you start this, it says he went to get rest, and then when he woke up, it was evening, and then he came walking on the water. We alluded to this a couple of weeks ago, that in the, the water and the wine scenario, that after that point, um, Jesus would not be able to hardly find a place to rest. And this time we find a situation where he actually says, I even need a little vacation from you guys. Can you imagine that? Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. But anyway, I thought that was worth mentioning. Well, yeah, and, and I love it because it's like, yeah, you're right. He, he goes to rest, but he also goes to pray too, right? Yeah. He's reconnecting with his father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, it's late by the time he comes out to the disciples. It's like three in the morning. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, but no. Ernie makes a good point. Jesus gives us a really important pattern for our own lives. And we were talking about that in terms of prayer. Because, Sage, you've been leading this yep. this uh, young adult Bible study here on Sunday nights. And you guys have been talking about prayer. And I was kind of confessing to you how I've most of my life I've been wired to pray as I go. I'm just sort of that kind of person. I pray as I go throughout the day. Kind of continuous little prayers all over the place. But I have found as I've gotten older that I need more than that. And and I sort of likened it to the idea of my marriage. My wife and I are around each other all the time. Yep. And we talk all the time and we're sort of connected all the time. And yet because of the busyness of that, we at some points recognize that we've lost a deeper connection. And so we need to get away, you know, yeah. for a weekend or an overnight to, to, to really reconnect um, in a more significant way. And I think that's a good metaphor for, for, our prayer lives too. Um, And so Jesus does this and you see it multiple times that he gets away in solitude to be with his father. And Randy, you think of what we do in ministry and what we call people to do in leadership. You just think of this, the importance of rest, importance of rest to our whole life and the importance of connecting to God because a storm is brewing. Right. We walk into storms. All of us walk into storms. Yeah. And you got to ask yourself, are you prepared to walk into that? And so as Jesus' example, very, very earthy, we need to get some sleep, and we need to get away once in a while. Yeah. And we need to ask God for stuff we can't do for ourselves, because it isn't if we are going to walk into a storm. We're going to follow Jesus into a storm. And, of course, this storm is is both literal and metaphoric. And metaphoric. It, it's, it's both at the same time. And much of Scripture, I think, works that way. Um, and we see the disciples doing nothing wrong. They're, they're not acting in disobedience, as I mentioned in the sermon. This is a storm of perfection, if you want to call it, that God is going to, Jesus seeks to refine 
his disciples uh, through this experience of the storm. Yeah. Again, a second way of revealing who he is to them, his divinity, his his deity, his power, his position. Um, but also, like um, I mentioned in it, not just not just a demonstration of power over the storm, but a demonstration of love because he comes to them within the storm. Yeah. And and I, I do think really strongly that that is something that is, is, makes the Christian God in Jesus Christ unique among all other gods. You don't see other gods do that kind of a thing. Hmm. And, and so I find that quite comforting to know yeah. that, that in my storm, uh, God will come. And, and, and I then need to be kind of like Peter and reach out and maybe take yep. some risks. So. so do you guys think that there's storms of perfection? You also believe there's storms of correction? Absolutely. You had mentioned that on Sunday. I've experienced both. both. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be corrected by a, by a storm? Does that mean if something happened in New Orleans again, a huge flood like that, God sent it to correct all of those people? I don't know about that. Yeah, because um, some are advocates of that, that God sends national disasters yeah. to pull people back. I'm really careful about that because who are we to judge the people of New Orleans? Uh, yep. And some may, some may not, you know. Uh, but I think in the in the sense of, I think it's a good idea in the light of Jesus' admonitions about judging your neighbors, I think it's a good idea to apply the idea of storms of correction at a more personal level and to say, and to say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me mm -hmm. through this? Yes. Is, and sometimes I think for a lot of us, a storm may be both. Yeah. It may be both a storm to correct us, but then also a storm to perfect us that both happen at the same time. Yeah. I can think of storms in my life where I think they were both actually, yeah. that they need, the storm needed to redirect me. But then once that happened, the storm then served to refine yeah. me a little more. So too. no matter what the storm, there should be introspection. That could be the third word in this. Right. Like perfection, correction. But both should, we should stop and say, hey, why is this storm coming and bringing it back? What do you think about that? Station? Well, it just makes me wonder, I just have the question then. It's like, when do we know we're in a storm yeah. or what do we, do we know? Ever, when we're in a storm, do we even have the chance to know if it's one of correction or perfection, you know? Well, know. And, and, and I think on the front end of a storm, we don't. We're often caught off guard by storms, um, and we're not sure what's going on, and there's a sense of sort of uh, we, vertigo in a storm. We're not mm -hmm. sure which direction is up or down. Or, right. And uh, we start to get confused. I think we it's easy for us to lose self-confidence in the midst of storms. Um, mm -hmm. These were grizzled fishermen out on the Sea of Galilee, a place that they knew quite well, and they were losing control. This was scary territory for them. And I think we find ourselves that way in the midst of these storms. And so the best thing, I think, to do from my experience, and I guess what I see in Scripture, is is to cry out to God, but, but maybe with that question... Um, uh, not just where are you, God, but what is it that you're trying to show me, Lord? What are you trying to teach me? It's sort of this, this sort of learning posture with God. What is it that you show me how you want me to navigate this storm or be with mm -hmm. me and help me navigate the storm and show me what it is that you want me to learn? Do you need me to change something about my direction? Do you need to change something about who I am and my character? Uh, what is it that you're trying to show me? Yeah, no, yeah. that's good. Absolutely. You know, when I think about storms, I think it's easy to be just really afraid in that time and lose perspective about, you know, you get very like, I just right now, just me is going to just disappear now or I'm going to just get destroyed by this and forget about, you know, to forget about God, to be honest. I mean, we were just before this, we were talking about um, a kid who went through Mm -hmm. A major life-changing storm. Right. Hunter Pinky, uh, our, our listeners may be familiar with his story. You know, this football player at UND has this horrible skiing accident. All of a sudden, this oh, young, you know, vigorous young male athlete is a paraplegic. And, and his doctors, I read a story about him, and his doctors were just, they've been quite amazed, um, and therapists, they've been quite amazed at his attitude, um, his rehab attitude and all that. And, and Hunter references his faith in Christ. And he, he says, yeah, I had a very brief, very brief why me moment, but it was followed by a much more substantial why not me mm -hmm. thing. And he says, 
as a, as somebody who believes in the hope of Christ and the hope of resurrection, I know this life is not all there is. And so I, I, I can embrace what has happened to me with a different attitude and to say, Lord, you want, you want to do something with me here. Yeah. That's a, that's amazing. I think that's just an incredible, incredible testimony yeah. to be able to, to roll with that the way he has a, a good example for all of us. You know, I think the why me moment, you know, is similar. I mean, okay, so we look at Peter, you know, and and I get the sense that maybe something I said caught people off guard, which is I said there's a moment before fear. Mm. And Peter experiences fear. He sees all of a sudden he shifts his focus and he sees the wind and the waves and he begins to sink. And I said, this isn't just about fear, that there's a moment before fear where Fear emerges because we've lost our focus on the one who's in control of everything. Mm -hmm. And we've put it on ourselves, thinking maybe we're in control. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. very subtle form of self-idolatry. Well, I'm the one walking on the water, right? Right. And, and, and so and, and, and we're not saying Peter's a bad person. In fact, Peter, out of everybody in the boat, right, as you said, Ernie, <laughs> Mm. He's he's the one that actually seems to have the most faith. I know. And he should be commended for that. Yeah. But he's also he's also in this story this really interesting quick little case study of we we walk out in faith, we we get hit by the wind of the waves and we sort of lose faith and then we have to cry out to God again for rescue. And mm. I do think that there's a certain pattern of that that is the human experience. Yeah. And thank God that we have Jesus to to be there to to pull us back up and then to yeah. grow us you know, through that storm. So that this is the same Peter who eventually was crucified upside down mm -hmm. and asked to be crucified upside yeah. down. Um, think about the, the change in faith in this man. Oh, I know. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and frankly, all the disciples were, you know, ended up having oh, this man. incredible rock solid faith. It wasn't a faith in a story. It wasn't a faith in an illusion or a group illusion. It wasn't a faith in a, a in a conspiracy. Hey, let's get together and just talk, just say that Jesus was God. You don't die for those things. No. Yeah. You die for something that you absolutely believe to be true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. so I think, you know, we see this incredible moment where Peter is dealing with this moment of loss of focus on the one who's in control. And what do we do? We just naturally put it on ourselves. And then we realize we're not in control. Yeah. And Don't we get scared. That's the yeah. human condition, seriously, that that there's, there's mountaintops. And so do we teach our people that a faith journey is just staying on top of this mountain? That's mm. all you got to do is stay up there. And we overlook... We overlook the importance of the valley as well. And I don't know about you guys, but in, in my life, I like to think that I trust in God with almost everything in me, if it's possible. And I, I think I have a very strong faith journey, but I find that I have some very pronounced human moments in my faith journey that I forget God is there. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. forget especially when the storm comes with a loud roar and when the wind is fierce and the metaphorical rain is falling all over me my humanness needs seems to take over and i'm reminded that i'm i'm flesh and that this storm could take me out yeah. and when i do it is it's anxiety it's fear and i have to literally go to places that are much deeper inside of me and convince myself that again I have a rock foundation to stand on. <laughs> Do any of well, you find out this too? Absolutely. <sighs> absolutely. I and again we don't want to portray Peter as the the this weak pathetic person in the story. He's not. He's the one that's stepping out of the boat. Yeah. And Peter simultaneously I think encapsulates the 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 strengths of faith and the weaknesses of human faith. Yep. Peter when he steps out of the boat teaches us all a lesson that um having faith in Jesus is not an excuse to not take responsibility for things in your life and to right. not step out and to not take appropriate um, God honoring risks in our lives and to you know and to 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 take those 
actions based in faith. But when he sees the wind and the waves, we're also taught by him that we must always do those things in submission to the lordship of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ um, and understanding that we're relying on his grace and his mercy and his power of the spirit all the time. It's when we start to drift away from that yeah. that we get into trouble. This What you guys are talking about just um, made me think of this interesting um, thing uh, an apologist I know talks about. He says there's a difference between belief that Jesus is Lord and belief in him. Oh. So he says even the demons believe that Jesus is Lord. Right. right? That's the uh, book that of James are, says right? that. Yep. Yes. But they don't trust in him as their Lord. Exactly. And, and I try to say the same thing many times in messages, Sage, when I say, God doesn't want you to just believe in Jesus. He wants you to believe Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Oh, exactly. that's a good. Good distinction. There's there's yep. a there's a big difference between those two things. And I know I had a moment in my life where I had to make the shift from the first to the second. That that growing and I met, and I alluded that in the message that that when I was young I saw Jesus more as fire insurance, but I was my own God. Yeah. I was my own Lord, and and so I believed in Jesus to the extent that He served me. Yeah. Wow. But I didn't believe Jesus as Lord. And when I made that shift and, and, and submitted to him as the Lord of my life, as this natural extension of him being my Savior, my life began to change. My mm -hmm. focus began. My priorities began to change. My strengths began to change. My calling began. To, everything began yeah. to change. Yep. That's where true peace is found. The peace that surpasses yeah. understanding will guard your hearts and minds because... Really, when you're in that, what storm is over Jesus? What what storm has the power or the ability to, uh, you know, <laughs> to take us to the degree in, in which we think it will take us? Well, think about what is the ultimate thing that the storm is a metaphor for. It would be death. death yeah. and, and if we are not afraid of death... Mm. What weapon can the devil bring to bear on yeah. us? Yeah, you know, he, he, there's no leverage there for him. All the great dictators leveraged a fear. When we talked about this with bread, he, they leveraged a fear of death and a fear of I'm going to take your bread away from me and I'm going to take your life away from me. Yep. And that's what they leverage. And then, of course, they're just personifying the devil. Really, that's what the devil does. Yes. The only other thing the devil adds into that mix is deception, deception and fear. And we talked about this, that, that this is why I, I said that that really brief moment before Peter's fear was a moment of self-idolatry. And I know people think that might sound a little harsh. And I don't mean it to sound harsh, but I think it's an honest assessment. Because remember Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. He didn't say to Adam and Eve, you need to worship me. We were laughing about that before we started yes. recording. You know, the devil isn't John Lovitz from Saturday Night Live running around in a red leotard going, worship me, worship me. That's not what he's doing. The, de the devil, all he wants to do is to get you to take your focus off of God, yeah. to just disconnect from the Lord just for a moment. Yep. Because in that moment, now he can start to do things. Yeah. And he can start to redirect you and he can start to introduce fear into your life and start to leverage you. You know, in, in C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, he talks about this idea of, well, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's this uh, uncle demon, you know, mentoring his nephew demon yep. who's up and coming, yep. you know, kind of learning the ropes, right? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and one part I remember distinctly because I've done this is the, the uncle is saying to his nephew, if you can get the guy to sit in church, it's fine, he can be in church. But if you can get him to think about anything other than worshiping God, right? perfect. Think about the person that's singing off. Make him think about the person that's singing off key over here. Yeah. Or how maybe they're, you know, the coffee doesn't taste that great this week. Right. Or, you know, that person's too tall and standing in front of me, you know. Right. Yeah. So the devil only needs to get you to focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's Absolutely. what he did with Adam and Eve. Hey, the devil would... plays victim to God. To us. Yep, he plays victim. I was wronged, and you need to join in the cause because he yep. is not. Good. And that's what he does. He yep. introduces into Adam and Eve self worship in the form of you can't trust this guy. <laughs> this God, he's holding out on you. He lied to you. Mm -hmm. You can become like him. So he, not once in the narrative 
or actually really any of the biblical narratives do we see the devil saying you have to worship me with the one exception when he tempts Jesus yeah that's the only one we really see but but the point is he's just getting, he just needs you to worship yourself mm-hmm. and that's so subtle isn't it mm-hmm. man i fight that all the time what I want to do versus what I think or know that maybe the Lord wants me to do yeah. on a daily basis, which is why I talked about Luther saying, hey, let's walk wet in our baptism. Let's remind ourselves. That was good. That we fall short. And uh, yeah, Martin had a few good things to say about this stuff. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. <laughs> man, the self-worship you're talking about just makes me think of marriage. Just in terms of like, man, it's you realize how selfish you can be sometimes. Oh in your marriage, marriage, you know. And and so maybe this is why marriage and children are really, I think, God institutions. Yep. Um and 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 not institutions in the bad sense of being institutionalized, but they're they're ordained by God in the sense that in marriage and in parenting, I can't think of two earthly relationships that refine you more. I know. That will that as long as you continue to tr- to pursue God in the relationships, will force you out of your selfishness more yeah. right yep yeah. my yeah. priorities flipped when my children came along absolutely you they know? had to and it wasn't always easy there were times when i wanted to hey what about me hey what about this I, i've always had this dream ah my they started all to, they changed mm-hmm. because love does that right mm-hmm. that's what mm-hmm. love does yep god comes to us in love so that we might go to others in love and rediscover god in those people yeah. Hey, we said earlier when we were talking about uh, about what what uh, one of the famous authors talked about how the Jews think about big bodies of water, and a lot of times it seemed like the Jews were afraid afraid of water, and the extraordinary thing that Peter did by getting out of the boat over this great big body of water. Um, the flood, Noah's flood, came and flooded the whole world. And so, is, is there the Red Sea? Yeah, the, the Red Sea incident where it came Jonah, up, Jonah, and the whale came up. But I was sitting here thinking, uh, if they were, if that was one of their biggest fears, was drowning in water, um, which is a fear of a lot of us. You know, the water takes us over. Um, and just flat out fear of of, uh, of drowning in water. Um, where was I going with that, Randy? I just I, I was, did you were you tracking with me here? Well, I just wanted it made me think of something because um, it made me think of some uh, something you preach too. There's a place in Revelation where we read that no longer any sea. Yeah, there's no longer any sea, yeah. and that, you know that never really yeah. made much sense to me. But if it's what about this when metaphor, you pass like through that, the water, right? the waters won't overtake you so there must have been a huge fear. yeah no you're right uh, you see it all throughout the old testament um that that water to the hebrew people and really ancient peoples in yeah. general too symbolized chaos yeah the symbol- leviathan darkness the descent, death, monster of the deep uh, destruction right so you see leviathan of the deep and you see you know jonah the water plays this role the red sea plays this role what is it the, in the very beginning of Genesis 1, Tohu Wabohu, God's spirit hovers over what? The, the waters. waters. Right, the waters. Wow. And so this is, and, and then brings order to that, right? So, yeah, in Revelation, the symbolism of there's no longer any sea, that doesn't mean that the new earth is not going to have beautiful yeah. bodies of water. Yeah. It means that that darkness and the chaos that is represented that. by that. So when Peter gets out of the boat, you're right. It's an immense step of faith. Because then I thought mm-hmm. later on, or maybe it was right at the same time, interesting to me when they instituted baptism, what they asked people to do. They asked them to literally walk in the water, and they were going to do the most unconscionable thing with them, and they were going to do what? They were going to push their head down under the water. Down yeah. under the water. Well, because then, baptism symbolized death, yes. unity of death in yes. Christ. That's the symbolizing. And then to it, bring yeah. them back out to say, "Listen, this is not anything to fear." I maybe, mean, maybe awesome. another little thought connected to that too is think about how Peter reacts later on after the resurrection, and they're out in the boat, 
and he's gone back to his old fishing days, and all of a sudden he sees Jesus on the shore. Yeah. He doesn't hesitate. He jumps out he of the jumps boat. Jumps in the water. His fear of the water is pfft, he's because he's so and and maybe a beautiful corollary to this story is G, that Peter jumps into the water because he's so focused on Jesus, he can't wait. He's going to go through the water to get to Jesus. And, yeah. and, and there's this beautiful abandon in that yet, that, that you see. So it begs, what's, your, what's our greatest fear? What is our greatest fear? What's yours? What's well, yours? and maybe we can tie that into what are the takeaways. Yeah. You know, since we're, yeah, we're at 25 yeah. minutes here. Absolutely. So what are the takeaways for, uh, for, for this? And... Ernie, do you want to start? What what you think your takeaways are? You know, there's another scripture that says, "For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind." Um, it seems like to me, fear stands alone against three things that God institutes: the, you know, the love, the power, and the sound mind. I think of the many times that I've been afraid of things in life, and physically speaking, they're things that any of us would fear but in those moments I just hope that I can just stop where I'm at and be reminded that there is no body of water metaphorically there's no storm there's no harm that could come upon me that that God doesn't have in his control and to be cognizant that Jesus is walking right next to me over this body of water or through this storm that just somehow helps me in in life. And more often, I won't become perfect at this, but more often than not, I hope that as I get older that I can tap into that more often, the peace that surpasses the understanding. My takeaway would be that there are going to be storms, um, and that's mm -hmm. just a fact of life. And when we seek God in the storm and we keep our eyes on him, there's going to be that storms of correction and perfection that are going to correct us and perfect us. Um, and we don't need to be afraid of death in that way. No. And I would just add that within those storms, as we encounter them, our audience encounters them, um, God comes to us. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Look for God. When you find yourself in the midst of a storm, look for Jesus yeah. and come and, and sit down and, and slow down like Pastor Ernie is saying. Slow down. Turn that fear into prayer, look yeah. for Jesus, and then say, what is it that you want to do in this moment with me, Lord? Do you want to correct me? Do you want to perfect me? Yeah. Are you preparing me? And then praise him like the psalmists do hmm. and say, but I know this storm shall too pass, wow. and the day will come when, Lord, you are the Lord of the storm. All storms will find their resolution and be at peace. Amen. How's that for a closer? Yeah, Ta -da. That helps me. It All does. right, Inspire family, thank you for joining us today, and God bless you.